Welcome everyone to our virtual 2021 PWS Family Conference presented by Solano. Last fall, Levo Therapeutics announced the promising results of their phase three clinical trial of carbatosin. Then earlier this year, they submitted a new drug application to the FDA, which is currently under review. Today, the Levo team will provide you with an update on their clinical trial. To get us started, I give you Sarah Cotter, founder and CEO of Levo Therapeutics. Hi, I'm Sarah Cotter, founder and CEO of Levo. I'm also a parent of a child with PWS. I started the company about five years ago with the mission to develop impactful therapies for our community. Today, we'll focus primarily on our lead program, intranasal carbatosin, or LV101, which is intended to address the functional oxytocin deficiency seen in Prader-Willi syndrome. Next slide. As you may know, multiple studies have shown a reduction in oxytocin-producing neurons in PWS. Oxytocin is an important hormone involved in many areas that represent challenges in PWS, like satiety and appetite regulation, social emotional behaviors, and anxiety. Trials of oxytocin itself have had mixed results with increases in temper outbursts seen at higher doses. We think this may be caused by off-target effects of oxytocin on another hormone's receptor, specifically vasopressin and its receptors. Carbatosin, or LV101, is similar to oxytocin, but it has the benefit of less off-target effects on vasopressin receptors and is longer acting. We ran a phase three study of LV101 called CARE PWS, and I'll have Jay Cormier, our senior vice president, walk you through the results. But before I hand it over, I wanted to thank those on this webinar who participated in this study, either as participants, caregivers of participants, or study sites. We are so grateful for your contributions to the study. And the image on the left shows how we placed a butterfly on our office wall in your honor every time a new patient was enrolled. With that, I'll pass it on to Jay to walk you through the study design and the results. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you everybody for coming today to, to hear this talk and to hear more about carbatosin. The clinical study that we'll be talking about today primarily is our phase three clinical trial. That study, which we call the CARE PWS study, was a phase three randomized placebo-controlled double-blind multicenter study. The study was really designed to evaluate the efficacy, safety, and tolerability of two different doses of intranasal carbatosin versus placebo. The two doses that we looked at were a 9.6 milligram dose and a lower dose at 3.2 milligrams. And each of those doses or placebo were administered three times a day, each dose occurring right before a meal. Uh, patients that were enrolled in the study uh, were enrolled with genetically confirmed PWS uh, uh, ages 7 through 18 at, at the screening visit. Um, after an initial eight-week placebo control period, uh, all, all participants in the study were uh, given active carbatosin for an additional 56 weeks of a long-term follow-up. And at the completion of the week 64 visit, they were then given the opportunity to continue receiving uh, drug during an ongoing extension period. We originally planned to enroll 175 uh, participants with PWS in this study. Unfortunately, uh, due to COVID, the, uh, the study was truncated uh, in, in early last year with 130 participants who had enrolled at that time and 119 of which had valuable data for efficacy prior to the pandemic. Those patients were uh, enrolled from a total of 24 clinical study sites across, uh, across three countries. 19 of those sites were in the United States, four in Canada, and one uh, site in Australia enrolled uh, study subjects before the uh, pandemic caused us to stop uh, enrollment. 
In our study, we looked at uh, effects on hyperphagia through the HQCT uh, endpoint, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. But one other uh, endpoint that we looked at, and, and in particular in our study, is an endpoint called the PADQ, or the PWS Anxiousness and Distress Behaviors Questionnaire. This questionnaire is a caregiver reported instrument that contains 15 questions. And it was something that we uh, helped uh, to design in collaboration with the Foundation for Productivity Research, as well as RTI Health Solutions, a, a consultancy that helped with the validation of the uh, HQCT questionnaire, and as well as uh, with the PWS Clinical Trials Consortium's Behavioral Outcomes Measure Group. The PAGQ captures observable behaviors in distress symptoms that are common among patients with PWS and is really designed to assess behaviors that are specific to PWS. And this is as distinct from normal uh, 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 measures that are used in uh, practices, psychiatry practices to assess anxiety in, in sort of generalized anxiety disorder or other anxiety disorders. This is really a PWS specific instrument. And, and the instrument has been validated in accordance with FDA guidance uh, on, on the validation of patient reported and observer reported outcome measures. Just to give you a flavor of what the PADQ looks like, here are the first couple, the first few questions. The, the PADQ asks caregivers to think about the seven days prior to taking the instrument and, and filling out the survey and thinking about the last week. And um, in each of the questions, it asks whether a given uh, element has occurred never, rarely, sometimes, often, or always, or almost always. And it's things like, how often did the person ask for excessive details about schedules or events? Um, how often did the person confirm or review information that he or she already knew? How often did the person repeat the same or similar question over and over? And how often the person did the person pace or move in an agitated way? And again, these questions have been designed with the specific manifestations of anxiousness and distress that we see so often in patients with PWS. So you will be hearing a little bit more about the PADQ as we go along, and hopefully that gives a better context for, for what we are measuring when we look at PADQ results. As I said before, the study was designed with three different groups of, of, in, of patients in the study, those that were randomized to receive placebo, those that were randomized to receive uh, carbitocin, either in the 3.2 milligram dose or the 9.6 milligram dose. And that placebo control period occurred over a period of eight weeks. At the week eight visit, again, the, those who were receiving 3.2 uh, carbitocin continued to receive the 3.2 milligram dose. Those who were on the 9.6 also continued to receive the 9.6 milligram dose. And those who were on placebo uh, were split into receiving either the high dose or the low dose. Participants, study uh, caregiver, or caregivers, participants, as well as the study sites, and even LEVO, we were blinded to whether a patient was on high dose or low dose throughout this period of time. Um, and again, the participants who finished uh, through the week 64 visit were given the option to continue to receive study drug uh, in, an, in that optional extension period that is still ongoing. Among the 130 uh, individuals that, that uh, participated in the study, we can see here the baseline dem demographics of those individuals. And really what we see here is that the demographics were generally well balanced. It's such that each of the various groups was similar to one another. The effects on hyperphagia uh, from baseline to week eight are shown here. We can see that the low dose, the 3.2 milligram dose, outperforms placebo, which is shown in gray. And then we can see here the results of the higher dose, 9.6 in blue, and then a pooled all individuals receiving carbitocin here shown in yellow. When we look across the various endpoints that we, we uh, looked at in the study, and that was the hyperphagia questionnaire we talked about, the Cybox, which is an, uh, a measurement of obsessive compulsive symptoms, the PADQ, which we've talked about already, and then clinical global impressions. And this is really the, the um, healthcare provider's uh, impression of 
the severity of PWS in the patient, both the severity at that given moment and the change from baseline to that, fo that particular follow-up visit, in this case, week eight. We look across the low dose, the high dose, and the pooled carbitocin, we see that in all but one case, the data favored drug over placebo. Uh, it, and then statistically so, in the, uh, for the lower dose, the lower 3.2 milligram dose, in each of these endpoints, except for the Cyvox instrument. I just want to point out, uh, it's important to point out that the primary endpoint of the study was the HQCT and Cybox improvements in the 9.6 milligram dose, which unfortunately did not reach statistical significance, though it did show uh, improvement versus placebo. Although these are just the results from baseline to week eight, I also want to show you what happened over time. And what we see is that following week eight, patients who are receiving LV101 carbitocin, they continue to accrue benefits. And these, this occurs over the period of the entire long-term follow-up period. And these improvements go down, the, the scores go down and they stay down throughout that week, the 64 weeks uh, period of time. In this chart, we're showing just a, just a couple of the subgroups, just in the orange as the patients who received the 3.2 milligram dose the entire time. The blue shows patients who received the 9.6 milligram dose the entire time. And then the green is just an average of all patients in the study. That would include patients who were on placebo in the beginning and then transitioned to receive drug. Just, and then thinking about the, the prior results, even though there were no statistically significant uh, improvements in the high dose, we do see that over time, those results do continue to accrue uh, in patients that, are, that continue to stay in the study. This, these trends in the long-term improvements of hyperphagia were also seen in the PADQ, where we can see uh, significant drops in the, in the uh, anxiety, the PADQ uh, response in all treatment arms. And they, again, the improvements accrue, and then they, then they are sustained throughout 64 weeks of follow-up. It's important with any drug to consider the safety profile of the drug. And when we look at what adverse events were reported during the placebo control period, we see there's uh, very few uh, uh, adverse events reported by, by patients in general. And those that are reported generally were mild and moderate in intensity and, and uh, transient in time. We can see that uh, diarrhea was the most, uh, the most common, uh, I'm sorry, diarrhea epistaxis, which is just nosebleed. Flushing was the most common and was experienced uh, exclusively in patients who received drug as opposed to placebo. Uh, headache, nasal discomfort. Uh, we did have uh, a couple of cases of fever and an upper respiratory tract infection. But by and large, the safety profile of the drug is very benign and, and looks to be uh, very well tolerated by patients. Uh, as Susan mentioned at the, at the outset, um, you know, we're excited about these, these data. Uh, there was a phase two study that was consistent with the data we see here that show, demonstrates that LV101 uh, has safety and efficacy and its ability to address PWS behaviors. Uh, we, uh, we filed that application with FDA earlier this year, and we are continuing to support our patients that are in the extension period. And following the readout of the data, we switched all of our patients from that were on the high dose, we switched them to the low dose. So all patients right now are receiving the 3.2 milligram dose. Also, as Susan had mentioned, uh, FDA will be holding a public advisory committee meeting regarding our application before FDA. That meeting will be held on November 4th. It will be a virtual conference, a virtual uh, advisory committee meeting, and all members of the public are welcome to attend. Uh, it, I know that uh, FPWR is holding a, a seminar on Friday morning. I believe it's at 11:30 Eastern. Uh, where you can find out a lot more information about how you can participate, and we would encourage you all to attend that particular uh, session. Uh, we will continue to keep you appraised of all the progress that we're making and any opportunities for participation in potential studies or other various regulatory interactions that come, come to pass. Um, I want to emphasize at the end here uh, everything that Sarah had said at the outset. We're incredibly thankful for everyone who participated in the trial, for all the families that helped 
and for the entire community's support in everything that we're doing at Levo. Before I, before I end though, I do wanna talk a little bit more about other things that we have going on at Levo. While we're very excited about carbatosin and all of its promise that it holds for the PWS community, Carbatosin is just the first of what we hope will be many innovations to address the, the features of PWS. And we, we currently have multiple programs in our pipeline that are looking at the underlying genetics and the pathophysiology of PWS. And we look forward to bringing those to the clinic as well. Our collaborations for some of our very early work is, is with uh, several major universities and institutions throughout the United States and elsewhere. Uh, just three of those are listed here, Massachusetts General, Columbia, and Duke. And we, we love working with our partners and trying to develop and discover new ways to bring treatments for PWS. Um, so again, thank you to everyone who participated in the study. We very much appreciate and value all the time that it took for you to participate. We couldn't have done it without you. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Jay, um, for uh, presenting to us a little bit of an update on this clinical trial. At this time, we are going to open up to Q&A. Just a reminder to all of you, there is a chat and then there's Q&A. If you want us to present your question, please use the Q&A box because things can often get lost in chat and we don't want to lose any questions that you might have. Um, so with that, we've had a couple questions come in already. Um, the first one is long-term data. So um, has the long-term data for Levo's trial been compared to that in the global PWS registry um, and the past study in particular? So we have not done a formal comparison to the data that are in the PATH PWS database. We do know from the database um, that individuals with PWS tend to have very stable uh, HQCT scores, for example, over time, and certainly over the eight uh, weeks in our placebo control period. So, um, and, and, and then even longer, I believe that the data there show that stability going out six months and beyond. So the kinds of improvements that we do see in our long-term uh, data are, are inconsistent with that natural history. It said differently, it, uh, our data would show an improvement versus those that, that natural history data that's in PATH for PWS. But to be clear, we have not conducted a formal analysis of that. Great, thank you. Will there be an additional study of um, carbatosin for adults? Or when if it gets approved by the FDA, will that be necessary? Sure, we are obviously still working through the regulatory process with FDA. We believe that the data that we see in our patients in the study would apply to patients who are older as well. Um, but that's, that's something that FDA will certainly be evaluating and, and we'll be in discussions with them. And, and, and you know, as those decisions are finalized later this year, we'll, we'll have a better insight as to whether an additional study would be needed for, for adult patients. Uh, does your team have any uh, thoughts about why the 3.2 milligram dose seemed to be more effective than the 9.6? Uh, sure. So how, when you look at other studies, for example, there was a study of oxytocin in patients with PWS and uh, conducted by Dr. Einfeld and others that showed that at higher doses of oxytocin, there seemed to be increase of temporal and behavioral outbursts. And these are the same very kinds of things we're looking for improvements in, in our study. And so it's possible that the, at the higher dose that we're seeing, uh, despite carbatosin being a more selective uh, uh, receptor, uh, more selective compound than the native oxytocin, it's not perfect. And it's possible that at the higher doses, we're seeing some off-target effects happening in individuals uh, in the study. Um, and, and so that masks their ability to see an effect during those first eight weeks. Um, and, and in fact, some of those individuals end up withdrawing from the study and discontinuing from the study on, from the high dose. And, but those who do choose to stay in the study, even on the high dose, experience uh, those benefits we were seeing in those long-term curves. So, we believe that the 3.2 milligram dose 
um, is able to avoid more of those off-target effects and, and give a greater uh, chance for individuals to receive benefit. Great. Uh, I believe you mentioned um, that the study participants are now on an open label extension. How long will they be able to continue on this medication for? Sure. We, we're committed to allowing those individuals to stay on drug as long as it is possible to do so. We look forward to, again, continuing to work with FDA. And if the drug were approved by FDA later this year, they would be able to continue on the extension period until the time that the drug is commercially available. That's great. Can you give us any idea of um, what the next steps would be after an FDA approval and perhaps how long it might be before people who are not in the study might have access? Sure, it's a great question. We, um, you know, getting approval from FDA is, is only the first step. Then, you know, there's a lot involved with making sure that we can uh, have adequate commercial supply and get uh, 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 approvals from various uh, payers, insurance companies that they'll be willing to cover the drug. And so there's a lot that goes into market launch. It's not something that happens overnight, but I can promise you it's something that once approved, we will be working extremely hard diligently to, to bring that to market as soon as possible. So when you say payers, we're talking about insurance companies, correct? Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. That was a term of art I should have avoided. So we're, we're going to talk as the drug gets approved, then I, as a parent, want to put my child onto Carbitos, and I go to my doctor, I ask for them to prescribe. Um, does an insurance company have a, the choice? Do they have to pay for it, or could they deny that request? So that that is in part a, an insurance company's decision as to whether they would provide coverage for a given drug, a new drug that's on the market. And again, it takes some time to talk with them and, and share the data with them and have them make their own internal decisions. They have their own processes that are involved in, in going uh, forward and, and deciding to, to provide coverage for those, those medicines. So we'll be working you know, diligently with all of those various uh, providers, the, the insurance companies out there, uh, whether it's the big guys or the little guys, and, and trying to get to a place where we can get it out to as many of you as possible as quickly as possible, because that our goal, as Sarah's mentioned at the front, is to bring these treatments to all of you um, as soon as possible, and, and we are dedicated to that, and we'll do everything we can to get there. All right. We have a lot of international participants on today's call, and they would like to know if they'll have access to Carpitocin at some point. Sure. Assuming that FDA is agreeable with the data, we will, you know, FDA is just the first step and we're certainly pursuing uh, similar marketing authorizations in other areas around the world is, is something that we look forward to doing. And, and we want to bring the drug to as, as many individuals with PWS as possible. And we know that the timelines for getting drugs approved and coming to market, you've said, are they're highly variable and it, and it does take time. So for our international uh, attendees today, how do, do we have an example of how long it takes if we can get a drug approved in the U.S.? How, what's, what's the lead time for, the, for another indication out in another country? So each country has its own regulatory body, like the FDA. And each of those bodies has their own processes and procedures. Some of them are quicker than others, um, but each government body ultimately wants to make their own decision on their own review of the data. So while FDA approval is helpful and, and helps to demonstrate that someone like FDA has, has looked at the data thoroughly and, and agrees that the drug is safe and effective, nevertheless, each of those regulatory bodies will make their own independent decision and it's really hard to, to generalize what those timelines can be, but they, they can take some time. But again, that's, uh, you know, our focus will be turning to, to bringing those things to market to all of you. Right. And Jay, just to uh, correct me, um, carbitocin is not currently available for use for treating Prader-Willi syndrome, nor will it be available off label um, unless it gets approved by the FDA. We need to get an FDA approval before it will be available to anyone. 
That, that is correct. Carbotocin is not approved in the United States for any indication, so therefore it's not available in any form in the United States. It's available in, an, in a different form in other countries, but that different form is an IV injection, and it's not the kind of concentrations that we are looking at for our, our program. So despite its availability in other areas for a different indication, that, that wouldn't really be the same as, as our intranasal uh, concentrations that we're really doing here. So um, at, at the time, there really is no uh, off-label way to get at, to, to acquire carbotocin. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question regarding the, the packaging and stability of, of carbotocin. So it is an intranasal spray. It needs to remain frozen until the day of use. Will that change once it's been approved or will it continue in that formation? So we, we've been collecting data and we'll be working with the FDA to, to determine exactly what the approved uh, storage conditions will be for the product. And again, we're, we're hopeful that we can uh, provide the product to individuals in a way that maximizes your flexibility and your ability to, to uh, provide the, the drug to your family, um, to your loved one in a way that's, that's most convenient for you. So we are, we are trying to build out the data and talking, we've been in discussions with FDA and, and we look forward to hoping to have conditions that wouldn't necessarily require freezing the, the product in your home because we recognize that, that that creates additional difficulties in certain circumstances. So we're working hard to, to make it easier for you as well. So the clinical trial, again, correct me, it was for ages 8 to 18, correct? It was from 7 to 18. But 7 yes. to 18. All right. So if it becomes FDA approved, what ages will be able to um, receive a prescription? Will it be limited to ages 7 and up? Will they be able to be younger? And will they need to have, for example, hyperphagia in order to get a prescription? So all of those questions are things that are still, you know, pending before FDA. So what, one of the key things that FDA will do during their review process, uh, should they issue an approval for the drug, they will issue an approved indication statement. And it's that indication statement that will help to uh, really answer those questions and, and, you know, draw four corners around what specific groups of individuals with PWS, if, if there are any, you know, any limitations to the label, that will be there. But we don't know that at this time. And, and of course, we, again, we believe that the product is something that can be used uh, by, by PWS patients uh, beyond age of 18. So are, we're hopeful that we can uh, bring it to market to, to all individuals with hyperphagia. Were there any negative side effects observed in the clinical trial? Um, certainly, we had had some side effects, uh, as you as you saw in the in the um, slides. We had some adverse events were observed uh, with use of the drug, as well as with use of placebo. Just to be clear, um, but you know, many of them that that were seen were. Um, Things that were very they were similar across from placebo to to the drug arms. Uh, the the main one uh, that was not really seen in the placebo arm was some flushing, and that did occur, which is just sort of you know some some warmth or warmth uh, feeling the sensations of warmth or or uh, pink uh, coloring in in the face or or limbs, and that would just be in each of those cases it was transient. Uh, just, you know, it resolved within, within uh, 30 minutes or so, and, and it seemed to sort of go, go down over time uh, as people took the drug more, more frequently. But even then, the, that was experienced by um, only a portion of the patients in this study. Great. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, I really appreciate you coming in. We have lots of questions for you, as can be expected. Um, I can say to all of our, you know, people on the call, I know that we, we are so invested in this. We really want to see um, this drug get FDA approval. And with that, I would like to share with you all that there is something that you can do. Um, I am inviting all of you to please join us on Friday. We're having a session at 1130 a.m. Um, Eastern time. Uh, the session is titled uh, Advocating for New Treatments for PWS. We will be spending this time talking to you about a very important 
upcoming uh, meeting. It's an advisory committee meeting by that's being um, host, you know, at, requested by the FDA. Part of that meeting includes um, public testimony from people in the PWS community and others. Um, and we are going to provide you with uh, more information about that meeting, what a typical meeting looks like, why they're having it, and of course, give you some tools that you could use to really make an impact in your comments um, to the FDA. So please join us for that session. If you can't make it live, register for it. Um, it will be recorded and I will do my best to get the recording out to everyone as soon as that, um, as soon as that session has wrapped up, I'm going to put the link into the chat. Um, it's there for you now. So if you click on that link, you can go and register for that session. Again, you know, as a member of this community, this is one of the most important things that you can do right now. So join us to learn more. Um, and then, of course, tune in on November 4th for that advisory committee meeting so that you can see in action um, you know, how the meeting progresses and the information that's being presented. So um, tonight we have a really fun family fitness session that's being um, brought to you by Leva Therapeutics. Um, the boy in the, in the photo here, this is Dante Johnson. I never get tired of telling this story. He's 16, he has PWS, and he has worked out more than 200 consecutive days um, and lost 50 pounds in doing so. So he's going to be coming and joining us along with um, a slew of other trainers from Let's Go Fitness so that we can have a fun workout. The family is invited as well as the kids um, come and get sweaty with us. And uh, tomorrow, make sure you come and join us for some more wonderful sessions and um, an update on another phase three clinical trial, uh, DCCR. So have a great rest of your day and we'll see you tonight or tomorrow.